Hi everyone, welcome. Just going to give it a brief moment for folks to join. Welcome, welcome to all who are joining. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Just going to give it a few more seconds. All right, well, let's get started. Um, my name is Sharon. I am the communications manager for Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York, and I am the virtual host of this webinar series. On today's webinar, we are going to discuss one of the deadliest threats to birds, migratory birds in particular, and that is, of course, glass. So we're going to address why glass poses a big threat to birds, what to do if a bird hits your window and how to prevent collisions at home. We're going to talk about community science programs that are studying, uh, studying collisions and Audubon's advocacy efforts at the local, regional, and national level related to bird safe buildings. Uh, our subject matter experts on today's webinar are speakers from Audubon New, Audubon, New York, Audubon, Connecticut, and New York City Audubon, our very special guests today. Um, this webinar will be recorded. I'll say that again. It will be recorded. Uh, right now it's broadcasting live on Facebook. So hello to everyone out there on Facebook. And it will be recorded and posted to YouTube. And of course it will be on Facebook and we'll send it out after the fact. Uh, questions are welcome in the chat box at any time. We do reserve time at the end to answer questions, as many as we possibly can. If we don't get to yours, we're sorry, but hopefully we'll get to everyone's. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to Caitlin Parkins. Caitlin is the Senior Conservation Biologist at New York City Audubon. Caitlin, you can take it away. Great, thanks so much, Sharon. Um, so like Sharon said, my name is Caitlin Parkins. I'm the Senior Conservation Biologist at New York City Audubon, where we spend a lot of time and energy addressing this issue. And so today I just wanna give a brief collisions overview, sort of the who, what, when, where, why of collisions in order to set the stage for the rest of our speakers. And so to understand collisions, we have to take a step back and sort of look at basic bird biology. Um, while collisions can happen to any bird at any time of the year, we do know that the majority of collision victims are migratory songbirds, um, and that the majority of collisions happen during this migratory period when they're moving between their uh, breeding grounds and their non-breeding grounds in the spring, and then again in the fall. And so these birds are migrating at night, and along the way, they need to stop and rest and refuel, and this is where they're in close proximity to our built infrastructure, uh, where they're at high risk for collisions. And the problem for these birds is twofold. So first, light like that from very bright lights, like the Tributin light, um, which you can see here attracting hundreds of birds, um, and also just like the general urban and suburban glow can attract and disorient birds because it messes with their uh, navigational cues that they use to migrate. And so our lights often will draw birds into areas um, that are densely built or even uh, just sort of moderately built up and puts them in very close proximity uh, to glass. And so when they wake up to forage at their stopover habitat, they're often sort of surrounded by this maze of glass, which can be a death trap. Um, and so the next question is, why can't birds see glass? It's not because they're stupid. Um, glass is made uh, to not be seen. And so if you look at this picture, um, it's hard to tell. Is that a tree? Um, just a picture of trees? Is it trees reflected in glass? Is it trees seen through a pane of clear glass? Um, and if we take a step back, okay, now we can see that this is definitely trees reflected in glass. And that's because People can't see glass either. We actually use architectural and visual cues to know when to expect glass. Um, maybe you yourself have run into a sliding glass door, so we only have to do it once and then we learn. Um, birds often die the first time, so they don't get to learn. Um, and maybe you know someone. Uh, and this video I love because it shows exactly the opposite of that, how uh, 
you know, you can actually place the visual cues in place and trick someone into thinking there's glass where it actually isn't. And so birds just don't recognize these visual cues. They see the world differently. They have lower contrast sensitivity. So uh, they see black and white better than shades of gray. And their eyes are placed on the side of their head so that they have good peripheral vision um, and they move really quickly. And so even if at the very last minute, maybe there's something that could cue them into the fact that glass is a solid barrier, it's often too late. There are three major types of glass or glass construction that kills birds. So first we have this reflective glass that's reflecting habitat. You can have vegetation, which looks like habitat, behind glass. And this can be a building lobby like the one shown here with trees planted inside. It could also just be a potted plant behind your window um, and your home. And then finally, see-through corridors or uh, corners or glass handrails. The birds see the habitat on the far side of the glass and try to fly to it. And so you might be wondering, is this really a conservation issue for birds? Maybe you've had a bird hit your window or one or two birds hit your window and maybe that doesn't seem like a big number. But when you add up all the buildings we have across the US, in the US alone, it's estimated that 100 million to a billion birds are killed every year due to collisions with windows, which makes it the second largest direct cause of bird mortality in North America. And it, this isn't just a high rise problem, um, you know, a city problem. 44% of collisions occur at low rise buildings and this includes homes. Like uh, the picture on the right is actually uh, one my sister sent to me. So she was finding dead birds. I asked her if there were windows in the area on her house there. She's like, yeah, just this one tiny window. I don't think it's the issue. And I asked for a picture of it and she sent me this. And you can see that sky and that tree reflected which only really happens in the morning in her particular case, that was actually enough to kill birds at her house. Um, and most collisions occur at the lower levels of a building. Um, this is where birds are active. This is where they're foraging. And it's also where that those trees and bushes and things can be reflected in glass. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of birds that collide with glass die on impact from brain hemorrhage. Uh, the ones that do survive sometimes have injuries that require rehabilitation. Um, or uh, sometimes injuries that can't be rehabbed. They're at risk, like this black pole warbler that I found um, was stunned and just sitting on the ground. They're at risk of being picked up by predators or stepped on by people. And scientists are just now looking into non-lethal effects. So these stunned birds that do make it and fly away, are there long-term effects on, say, their ability to navigate and migrate? We don't know yet, but hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to learn some things soon from some new research projects going on. And finally, um, luckily for us, mitigation is really easy. All you have to do is put a visual indicator on the glass that alerts birds that it's a solid uh, barrier that they can't fly through. Um, the golden rule, if you will, um, of spacing for those is two by four inches apart. And this makes them close enough together that birds uh, don't appear to think that they can fly through. And it can be as fancy as like specially made ceramic frit glass that also uh, increases the heat, the cooling efficiency of a building to something as fun and simple as just painting on them with tempera paint. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jillian Bell from Connecticut Audubon uh, to talk more about collisions at homes and, and what you can do to help birds. We might have to give Jillian just one quick second to come on, but uh, Jillian, you with us? Hi, I hope all everybody can see me. Um, let's see. And Sharon, does everything go with my screen? Everything is great. Yeah. All right, so I am Jillian Bell, and I am the Bird Friendly Communities Program Associate here at Audubon, Connecticut. And I'm going to go over with everybody some different issues that you might have um, with birds and windows or glass near your home. So we spend a lot of time to attract birds to our yards, our patios, we make container gardens if we've just got a little balcony. And when we do that, we're also inviting them to be near glass, um, which is very dangerous for them in terms of collision and also in terms of perceived territory uh, encroachments from other birds. Uh, where you have birds and windows, you will definitely have collisions. Um, birds 
can't see glass as we heard just now, um, so they will run into it. This is a lovely little cardinal, and as you can see, he believes that there is another cardinal encroaching on his territory. And so I say he because it's uh, predominantly the males that are territorial uh, in the springtime, especially when they are forming their areas that they want to have for any nesting and egg laying that may happen. So when they see another bird that looks like them, they get pretty upset and they will smack into the window, they will smack into glass wherever they're seeing that reflection. And while that won't harm, um, like severely harm the bird, it will definitely tire them out which can make them more susceptible to exhaustion, um, which can make them more susceptible to predators preying on them, which is no good. And cardinals are not the only birds that, there, there are a few um, birds that will exhibit this behavior. Um, I just picked a few of my, my favorites here. We have the American Robin, the goldfinch and an eastern bluebird. Um, it's been documented that even turkeys <laughs> will do this if they can get near your window. So like I said, there's a lot of different species that will attack their, their images. And something that you can do to help prevent that is, um, I've seen people using soap on their windows. You can just take a bar of soap and rub it on there. Anything you can do to break up that reflection. Um, people have tied bags over their rear view mirrors or their side view mirrors on their cars um, or just draped a, a t-shirt over the mirror or the window that the bird seems to continually be, atta be attacking. Um, and those are helpful. In terms of bird, wish, ah, bird window collisions, most people don't actually notice when birds collide into their windows uh, unless it leaves a spot like that um, which isn't very pleasant and it's actually it makes me sad to see Oop, I went ahead. and the reason why we don't see birds after they've run into a window sometimes is because cats will eat them chipmunks will eat them there are a lot of predators out there that will eat a bird that is just lying there and apologies to anybody if this is disturbing for you to see I know it's really sad, um, also a circle of life. So the majority of bird window collisions will happen, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having an issue with my screen. Uh -oh. Give me one moment, oh, I'm sorry. My PowerPoint is frozen. I'm sorry, y'all. I promise it'll be worth the wait. <laughs> Well, while Jillian is figuring that out, we'll just give her a second, but I just want to remind everyone that you can, as our speakers present, post questions in the chat. If you're watching from Facebook, you can uh, put your questions in the comments. Um, all of our speakers are in the chat available to answer questions if they're not the ones speaking. Um, so for instance, we got the, the question, uh, does the 9-11 uh, tribute in New York City affect birds? Um, Caitlin was able to answer that it, it does attract birds and traps them in the beams. Um, and actually thanks to a partnership New York City Audubon has with um, the producers of the 9-11 tribute, we monitor the birds and, um, and the producers turn the lights out for 20 minutes at a time throughout the night to allow the birds to escape the lights and continue on migration. Um, so any and all, all questions, we are here to answer them um, at the end, but also right now as we figure out our tech issue. Looks like we're good to go. Great. Sorry about that, y'all, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Sharon, for chatting with everybody while I figured that out. So the, as I was saying, the majority of bird window collisions will happen actually at home. Um, and I say that not to take away from um, any other collisions that, 
that may happen out there, but the numbers are just really high at residential and low rise buildings um, because they're happening daily. Whereas sometimes with a really, really tall building uh, with a lot of glass, there may be a lot of deaths at one time from a flock flying through on their migration. Um, whereas daily, these one-off birds are just smacking into the windows in our residential and low-rise areas. So that's that to keep in mind. Some solutions, um, since we know that glass can be harmful for birds and that's a really sad fact, so what can we do about it? Two ways that you can help to prevent bird strikes are from either having a physical barrier, such as netting, like you see here. Um, and that kind of netting would need to be left up year round because a bird can run into a window at any time of day, during any season. Um, so it's, it's just good to leave those things up. Um, and another way you can do that is to make the glass visible. which means we're gonna make it visible for the birds to see and they won't run into it. Some of the ways we can do that are by using Acopian bird savers, which were mentioned earlier. Um, these are really easy to do and expensive. You just get a center bar and you hang them. Um, you keep them four inches apart. And I'm gonna to talk to you in a little bit just about spacing for any other things you may wanna use on your windows to prevent bird collisions. Another great thing that you can use is pattern kaleidoscape. Um, people will use it. I don't know that I would personally use this one on my own home, but it is, it does work. Um, and I'll show you a picture in a, in a moment so you can see what it looks like from the inside uh, right here. So you can see out still, but from the outside, that's what the bird would be seeing. So they know not to run into it um, because as we heard earlier, those reflections really do matter um, if a bird is trying to flee a predator, predator and they run into the glass um, thinking that they're escaping to more habitat when they're actually just escaping into a reflection of habitat. Um, Kaleidoscape also comes in decals. And I know earlier I mentioned the two by four rule. It's really important that you space things, oops, space things two by four apart, um, two inches high, four inches wide, or the way around so that it breaks up as you can see here in the middle the idea that there may be habitat because even really small windows birds will figure try to figure out a way to get through them and it won't work because it's glass kaleidoscape also sells clear um, as you can see here it kind of from the outside it'll just it almost makes it look matted rather than shiny and reflective then there is bird tape, which is another fun one. I know some of my colleagues will use bird tape and feather friendly, um, which is do it yourself. And I think it can take a bit of time to install, but once you do it, it'll last for a while. And an important thing to remember about any of the bird tapes that you might find or stickers or kaleidoscape, it's really important to put it on the outside surface because if it's behind the glass, that glass is still really shiny and can still reflect habitat. Another fun one um, that I've seen a lot of my schools that I work with use is tempera paint. And you can make all kinds of fun designs and it can wash off with the rain and you can paint it again. These are really pretty, so I'll just show those. And you can keep your blinds down, but it only reflect or it only works if you don't have really shiny windows, like I was saying, that reflection. Um, like even here, I can see the trees there on that reflection. So there you go. And in terms of what is bird friendly and who decides it or not, there are a lot, the slides are advancing on their own and I don't know why. Um, there are a lot of products out there claiming to be bird friendly without actually having been tested. The ones that I'm recommending today to you have been tested um, in experiments and have been proven effective. Um, so there's that. If you have seen these raptor silhouette decals, um, they can work, but like this, they won't work. There's two, and if you look around, if you look around, there's so much space or here or here or over here for them to try to fly, for a bird to try to fly between. So that two by four rule is really important to remember. 
Placement of bird feeders is really important. I have one of these on, um, actually I have two of these on my windows. And they say if it's within three feet of the window, it can greatly reduce them from crashing into the window because they are gonna slow down to approach that feeder. UV materials are out there. They are studying them. I don't know that there's been enough science behind it just yet in terms of if it's going to work. But this is an example of a material that, to the naked eye, you don't really notice, but below on the right, you'll see that's what we're thinking birds would see because birds can see the UV. And I put this in here just again because there are a lot of products claiming to be bird friendly, but they may not be. So just make sure you do your research um, on anything you might be thinking about buying. And this is just a recap of all the different things that I just showed you. In terms of wildlife rehab, if you do have a bird that has run into your window, um, here are two great sources for information of who to contact for a wildlife rehabber in Connecticut. You could follow uh, or look up Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Sharon will post the links for both of these websites uh, in the chat. And in New York, there's the Department of Environmental Conservation they will be able to connect you with a wildlife rehabber. And the two links that she's sharing will directly do that. So you hopefully won't have to navigate around a website to find them. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Aurora. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, let me go and share. Hi everybody, my name is Aurora Crooks. I am the Conservation Associate here at New York City Audubon. And today I'm just gonna be giving you guys a super brief overview of NYC Audubon's collision monitoring programs, our Project Safe Flight program, and then I'm gonna be going over what we do with Feebird really fast. Um, so collisions, I just wanted to say that collisions are in fact a worldwide problem. They are not just in cities. They are not just in towns, it's in America, it's all over, the, all over the world. And the reason that it's a worldwide problem is due to the intersection of human development with population ecology and how we develop different areas with and declining for, in terms of conservation biology and po declining populations. Um, most notably with birds in particular. Um, but for that, New York City in particular, we have um, a collision monitoring program that has been going on since 1997, where volunteers walk in specific routes during migration, and we call this Project Safe Flight. Now, these routes aren't really meant to be complete coverage of the city, but we're, they change depending on what we're trying to learn. And you can kind of see on the right here, what are the biggest problems for birds and bird mortality rates with bird, window collisions being you know, among the top of them. So our Project Safe Flight, this is our you know, collision monitoring effort. So for over two decades, since 1997, we have conducted these monitoring um, with our community scientists, our volunteers in a collaborative effort to assess the magnitude of these mortalities and assess the magnitude of bird building collisions in the city. Um, and to do that, we, ha we have to use collaboration and we have to pinpoint problem sites, problem buildings in particular, and find these solutions. Um, as you can see, we aim to minimize the hazards from birds and glass. And, and so we do that with our collision monitoring. And here's just a few of our volunteers scoping out on their routes. Um, so collision monitors, what they really do during spring and fall migration, they spend one morning a week, just one, um, scouting a selected building for bird collision victims. And then fatalities are reported to NYC Audubon, where we further study these specimens and injured birds are taken and rehabilitated to various wildlife rehabilitators in the city, most notably the Wild Bird Fund in Manhattan. Um, each migration, we take in around three dozen volunteers, around 30 or so, people can take each other shifts and we train them. If they're up to the task, we go through the measures of training them, we provide all materials and we teach them how to collect and gather data so we can actually tackle this problem. Um, but that's not to say that New York City is the only city doing this. Um, there's the Chicago Collision Monitors, Mass Audubon's Avian Collision Team. And if you do a quick Google search, there might, there more than likely is some kind of collision monitoring effort going on in your city or your town or your state that you could probably get involved in. And if there isn't, I will teach, I will show you how to get involved otherwise. 
So basically we draw on this research and we draw on these, you know, quite sad mortality fatalities. Um, we draw on this research to educate architects and real then the real estate community and assist them in implementing solutions. Sometimes those solutions involve retroact retrofitting or some kind of retroactive so solution. And sometimes it's just like teaching architects how to build more bird friendly buildings in the future. And so we also not only have Project Safe Flight, but we also have something called DBIRD. And DBIRD is an NYC Audubon collaborative database to log bird mortality. And the cool thing about DBIRD is that you can do it anywhere. You do not have to be in New York City to do DBIRD. Um, and here on the left, you can really see the DBIRD report and what it looks like if you go on it mobily. Um, so DBIRD was created in 2014, it's pretty recent, as a project of NYC Audubon to help collect incidental collision reports from the public. It's, so it's not necessary, it's not on the same level of Project Safe Flight, but this is extremely helpful in measuring all of the incidental collisions that go on beyond the points that we specifically measure with our Project Safe Flight program. Um, it does not require any kind of password. It takes only about a minute to enter data about the bird, and upload a photo of the bird if you see one in your neighborhood, on your block, on your street and you can just simply log it into DBIRD. And we use that data to help kind of vitally find out where all of these collision sites are really happening. Where are the biggest collisions? Where are the most collisions? And what, what, which birds or which species are colliding the most? Um, and so here is kind of an aerial map of downtown Manhattan and North Brooklyn. And these are all DBIRD data points that people have entered. Um, and we can really just pretty easily see where the biggest problem sites are on like these aerial maps. Um, DBIRD really helps us identify the extent of the collision problem in the city and create maps to illustrate it, um, which can be helpful with advocacy and outreach, with getting legislation passed, with education about this issue. Um, if this is in downtown Manhattan, it happens to be a, a hot spot for collisions, but it's not only downtown Manhattan. And it's like I said, it's a worldwide issue, but I'm focusing on New York. But, um, and here's kind of a zoomed out version where you can see not it's not just downtown Manhattan, it's the city at large. Um, New York City beyond downtown Manhattan has, um, the data shows us the collisions are a problem that extend beyond that and simply the borough and extend beyond the borough of Manhattan itself. And it's for this reason that our DBIRD project safe flight research has begun to actually extend outside of Manhattan or a singular borough when you look, kind of look at all of these different things. Um, and so, like I said before, the, you do not have to live in New York City to participate in DBIRD. This DBIRD is for the whole world to use. And Atlanta Audubon actually, along with a few other cities, utilizes DBIRD in mapping bird collision mortality rates. So you can kind of see some of the collisions that have appeared in Atlanta. Um, and here is the world so far on collision rates. So, so far we have 4,509 collision reports um, globally and in six countries so far, which are the US, Canada, China, India, Turkey, and Norway. Um, though most are in NYC, just because we spend a lot of time in NYC talking about DBIRD, but it is something you can do all over the globe, all over the country. And you can see that we are kind of working towards this. And we hope to increase accessibility to DBIRD to make it even easier and faster to report collisions so we can actually really study the scope and the impact of collision mortality rates and implement solutions via this research. Um, and so one way we are doing that, and here's the link here, it's dbird.org. One way we're doing that is that we're gonna actually be giving DBIRD a makeover. We have actually put some funding into kind of revitalizing DBIRD and making the um, interface quicker and faster and easier to log data. Um, and it's not only going to be visually sleeker, but we're aiming to increase its technological capacity so we can gather more data um, to help others tackle this problem, ta help others tackle this issue all over the country and the world um, with the problem of collisions and by enacting that change and building solutions that we can, we can actively use. And Molly Adams is kind of going to be extending on that a little bit more. So that is my presentation. Thank you guys so much. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm just 
having some technical difficulties sharing my screen um, or sharing my video. I think here we go. All right, no matter how many times you practice that, it's always difficult. But hi everybody, my name is Molly Adams and I am the Advocacy and Outreach Manager for New York City Audubon. Research on window collisions and their solutions is aiding policy, um, uh, the advancements of bird-friendly policies across the world. I'm going to do a brief overview of the advocacy work that New York City Audubon has done since the start of 2019 as part of our bird-friendly buildings campaign. The local bill, th the three bills that I'm going to discuss are INT 1482, Local Law 15 in the New York City Council, New York State Senate Bill S25 and its companion bill in the Assembly, and HR 919 in the US Congress. So this campaign prioritizes local policy in New York City, but it also includes advocacy for the New York State Bill and National Bill, the latter you can currently take action on, and I'll point you towards that at the end. Um, but I joined New York City Audubon in February of 2019, and in March the following month, Council Member Rafael Espinal and Speaker Corey Johnson introduced Bill INT 1482 in the City Council. This bill proposed a change to the New York City Building Code requiring all new construction to use only bird safe glass. We quickly put together a working group with our partners at American Bird Conservancy, local sustainable architects, conservationists, and policy folks. Together we worked with City Council to amend the bill to allow bird friendly materials besides glass like those that Jillian discussed and to require them only on the first 75 feet of the building. After a few rounds of amendments, together we made the bill both adoptable, practical, and enforceable. Advocacy volunteers were integral in our outreach campaign that included emailing, calling, tweeting, and sending custom postcards to public officials regarding bird-friendly buildings at the city, state, and national level. The city council bill gained a lot of attention with tweets of window collision victims, which turned into press coverage. And when it came time for a public hearing, more than 30 people and organizations provided testimony in support of the bill. Over the year, the bill gained a ton of momentum passed and passed in December with a full city council vote of 43 to three. So as of now, all new buildings in New York City constructed after January 10th of 2021 will be required to be uh, bird friendly by law. At the state level, Audubon New York's policy lead was working diligently to pass a bill in the Assembly and Senate that would create a Bird-Friendly Buildings Council. This bill was first introduced in 2011, taking nearly 10 years to gain support. New York City Audubon joined Audubon New York to lobby in Albany, asking key representatives to, to support this bill. And in June of 2019, it passed both the Assembly and the Senate. Unfortunately, this bill was vetoed by the governor in December, but we plan to support Audubon New York in making sure a similar bill gets passed at, at the state level as soon as possible. At the national level, HR 919 is a bill in the US Congress introduced by Representative Mike Quigley that would require all new public buildings to be bird friendly. On July 1st of this year, just a few weeks ago, the US House of Representatives passed HR 919 as an amendment as part of HR 2, the Moving Forward Act. Since 2008, more than 20 cities, states, and counties have passed bird-friendly legislation, but if this passes in the Senate, it will be the first national bill of its kind and set an example for the rest of the world. You can urge your US Senator to support this bill by going to the link in the chat. Um, if you have time, calling your senator or writing them a postcard or letter can have even more impact. With enough support, the U.S. will have a nationwide policy requiring bird-friendly public buildings by the end of 2020. If you're interested in learning more about ways to encourage local bird-friendly policies or have questions about other parts of this presentation, please reach out using the following emails. Thank you. Great, thank you, Molly, and thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we now have a few minutes reserved for q and I know a lot of folks have been uh, putting your questions into the chat. 
Um, you can continue to do so, but uh, in the meantime, um, we got some questions in while you all were talking. So I'm just going to ask, and if you want to answer, just put your hand up and, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so first question uh, is about additional options for deterring birds from hitting um, or attacking windows. Uh, the question is, would hanging shiny things like old CDs work? And I don't know if any of our panelists have an idea. Caitlin, um, if you wanted to answer. Yeah, I imagine uh, if you hang them outside your window and they're spaced two by four inches apart that they would deter birds, um, but just sort of like one or two shiny CDs um, probably won't be enough to, uh, you know, to deter birds from flying. Pretty much everything you use needs to be very close together um, in order to work. Is there anybody, can I tack, tack, on, tack onto that? Um, if it's, I guess, the size of an average hand, um, it's too big for a bird to be able to fly through. That's like a general like visual thing. If you're not somebody who's like, ah, oh, let me whip out my handy dandy ruler right here. Um, just make sure that where you're spacing things is closer than your handprint. Thank you. Um, and uh, for folks who want to put bird feeders outside their homes, um, how can you, what's the best positioning for a bird feeder? Um, this one uh, person who asked the question said, I read if the feeder is within three feet of the window, then uh, it should be fine. Do we have a response? We don't have to have a response immediately, but um, we can certainly look into it and get back to people if we don't have an answer in this very moment. Um, do the external decals for the windows work for birds of prey as well? Um, someone had a juvenile Cooper's hawk fly into a window of the house and thankfully was taken by an animal rescue and given a clean bill of health. Um, but the question remains, do the external decals um, work for birds of prey. Caitlin? Yeah, and anyone who has additional info, feel free to add on. But um, yeah, it, they should work. Um, we find that birds of prey collide far less often than songbirds. And usually when they do, it's because they're chasing either chasing a prey item and just very distracted, um, or uh, they're young birds that are just not familiar um, with, uh, you know, what build infrastructure is. Um, so we do find birds of prey uh, collide far less, but yeah, the d external decal should certainly work to alert them that the glass is there and a solid barrier, just like it would for other birds. Anyone else want to tack on? Okay. Um, when Aurora was presenting, uh, someone wrote in about uh, what you're using for mapping. Are you using ESRI, E-S-R-I? Aurora, do you want to not, take Not to my knowledge, but um, we are using a mapping system, but I don't think we're using E-S-R-I -E right now, so. Yeah, it's not Esri based. Um, we use OpenStreetMap as our, our background um, and our developer sort of, I don't know exactly how the internal workings of DBIRD work, but it's not Esri. Um, it's something that's totally free and open and allows us to like create this system and not require people to have a password to log in in order to report collisions, which is really critical if you wanna get these incidental collisions that um, you know, people are just like walking by and they're like a dead bird, weird, and they Google it and see D-Bird. Well, if they have to create an account and log in to report it, there's no way they're going to do it. And so we've tried to, you know, streamline it and make it super easy for people to um, do that. And, and Esri doesn't have, to my knowledge, a platform like that um, available. Thanks all. Um, a question about uh, timing. How seasonal is the threat of bird mortality from window collisions? 
Uh, does collision probability relate to either migration or territorial defense for breeding? Um, how seasonal is the issue? Go ahead, I, I, I was going to yeah, I like the higher. There's a much higher incident of collisions during spring and fall migration. Like that's as far as I am. But like collisions happen at any point in the year, but they're just because there's a sheer influx of, particularly in New York City, just because there's a sheer influx flux of birds. You know, either coming north or coming south that use New York as a stopover habitat. Then that like drastically increases the number of collisions, just simply because there's more birds and a greater diversity of species of birds who are coming. So I can say. As far as I know, yes, it's sometimes seasonally related, but that doesn't mean that there's no collisions going on in the winter or the summer. And um, Caitlin or anybody else can, or Jillian can kind of expand if, they, if you guys would like, or Molly. Also, another thing that um, during migration is if there's really bad weather, it can force the birds to fly a little bit lower than they probably normally would, um, and that can increase their chances for running into glass. Uh, but as Aurora was saying, they can run into glass at any time um, in any season with migrations being where you have like those big mass events happening. Great, thank you. Um, Molly, a couple questions in the chat for you. Um, just looking for a clarification on, on uh, whether the governor didn't sign the bill or whether it was vetoed. And if so, if you could explain a little bit more about what that process was and why it happened. Sure. Um, so yes, the governor did veto it. He did not sign it. It is not law. Um, his explanation was that the environmental folks who would be in charge of um, paying for this, this uh, council um, were under a lot of stress because of other environmental bills that had been passed. Um, the bill, again, I, if I wasn't clear, would have created a bird friendly building council at the state level and they would have been required to produce um, statewide um, goals and uh, in, in the um, explanation, it was said that this was not necessary because there are so many people are, are already studying this issue. And while there are a lot of people studying this issue and organizations, um, this council, I do think, would have provided a bit of coherency, um, especially tackling this issue statewide. So either um, we will advocate for this bill moving forward in, in future years or attempt to uh, introduce another bill or an amended bill that would go further than just creating a council. Thanks, Molly. Um, going back to bird behavior questions, uh, we have someone wondering why a bird would continually try to attack the same window over and over again? Doesn't it learn what's going on? Jillian, you look like maybe you wanted to take that one. Sure. Um, they, they just see the reflection and they think that it's another male that's encroaching on their territory and they are not having it no matter how many times they smack in. Um, I've seen some comments where people are like, this bird just won't stop, it keeps going. Um, and I think that that really does highlight the fact that they don't know that it's not a real bird um, each time and that they will keep going until they're tired and it can keep them from going and looking for nesting materials or for food because they're so agitated by this reflection that they're seeing. So um, that's one of the reasons why we recommend if you can cover it. I saw somebody um, mentioned that they put cardboard up. Um, I think that's a really great one. Um, to just say, hey, stop. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I'll throw this one out there. Um, do LED certified buildings include regulations to make them bird friendly? Does anyone know? Caitlin? Yep. Uh, so there is a uh, lead pilot credit. I don't know why it's called a pilot credit. It's been around for a very long time, but it's lead pilot credit 55 um, if for uh, bird friendly materials. Great. Um, 
Jillian, this one might be for you. Um, how do you know that a bird um, should be taken into a rehabber? Uh, are there signs of things that the bird is doing that, you know, that tell you whether you should just leave it be for a while or, or take it to a rehabber? Sure. Um, so I, I kind of have a, a question back. Um, it is, if it's a bird that has, you know for a fact, has hit a window, like you heard the thump or you see the smudge, um, then you should get it to a rehabber sooner rather than later. Um, and if it's just a bird that you have found in your yard that is acting off, it's got like little, it's kind of squinting, it's been in the same spot for more than two hours. Um, if it is a fledgling, like if it's a baby bird with some fluff on it, it's probably just fledged its nest and its parents are nearby and they're gonna come back and feed it, um, but not if you're too close to it. So one, observe the bird um, and see what's going on. Is a parent coming back and feeding the bird? And two, check out how long it's been going on for. Um, with birds that have had collisions, um, even if they seem okay, they should be checked out because they can have internal injuries. Um, that will still allow them to be able to fly um, and hop off that could then within 24 hours simply it could kill them. Um, similar to how if, if a human were to get a concussion um, we could walk away fine sometimes and then you realize later that there's some serious internal injuries. So if two answers to that if you know it's a bird collision you should get it to a rehabber um, as soon as possible. And if you don't know that it's a collision, but you just see a bird that's acting funny in your yard, observe it a little bit. Can I just add, um, and Jillian, I'm sure you didn't see this because you were speaking and not looking at the chat, um, but another question came in that was related to this as to whether you should give the bird anything like water or food. And all the rehabbers I've ever spoken to have said, please don't, yeah, don't give the bird anything, um, no water, no food. Um, and that's, that's what's best for them. Great, and um, as far as identifying birds, folks are interested in identifying birds that are, that are coming through, that may be attacking their window, that may have hit the window. Um, obviously Audubon has an app for identifying birds, but there are certainly a number of different apps, so I don't know if anyone has a favorite that you'd like to share. Um, uh, but you can uh, download the Audubon app. You can um, search for a bird depending on its color, its size, the habitat that it's in, and we will share the link um, in the chat for that. Um, we also had a question about whether D-Bird is for New York City specifically, New York State, or, or for everywhere. Aurora, looks yeah, like. I, I wanna say, um, D-Bird is for everyone. D-Bird is not New York City or New York State specific. We just get the most data there because it came from New York City Audubon, but anybody can use it literally wherever you are. If you see a dead bird, you can log it into D-Bird and eventually I promise you that data will be used perhaps in a presentation like this or even perhaps to like start a collision monitoring program where you are, but don't believe because you live, you don't, if you don't live in New York City or New York State, that's fine. We actually encourage more people to use it who aren't in New York City and New York State because we want more data. So I hope that helps. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, Jillian, go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to say also another app um, for anybody that might be watching that is outside of New York or Connecticut um, and looking for a wildlife rehabber. Uh, Animal Help Now is a website, and I think Sharon, I don't know if you already shared the link for it, uh, but you can put it in the chat for everyone, that it's a good website and also an app for all over the U.S., so you can find a rehabber wherever you are. Thanks, Jillian. I will put that into the chat right now, um, and the questions are slowing down, and we're almost out of time, so I'll just... Uh, give it to the panelists if there's anything else you want to let people know. Um, maybe we can remind folks about how to get involved. Um, so if you know you want to volunteer, um, if you want to uh, get involved with uh, some of the actions that we're taking, the link to the action alert is in the chat, but um, if you want to get involved on the ground, Caitlin, Molly, Aurora, 
You want to let folks know? I'm going to, I threw this in the chat earlier, um, but if anyone wants to volunteer with New York City Audubon, you can use this email, communityscience at nycaudubon.org, and that'll connect you with Aurora so that um, you can get trained and get out in the field and work with us. And I just wanted to add, I saw a question earlier about how to approach a building that might be a problem. Um, I would recommend uh, first contacting your local Audubon chapter or bird club and see if uh, they have any resources. And if not, you can reach out to us at New York City Audubon and we can send you some materials. Um, and then getting a meeting with the building owners or if it's a condo board um, and, and having these conversations and offering solutions to them is a really great first step um, if there isn't policy in place or legislation that you'd also be able to advocate for. Thanks, Molly. So we will compile as many of these links as um, we put in the chat, potentially more, uh, and the webinar will be recorded as a reminder. We will um, be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered with all of the links and all of the email addresses of our panelists and, and for the community science folks um, to get involved. And we hope that you join us in the future. We host webinars every third Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. on different topics related to birds and how to help them thrive. So thanks to all of our panelists from New York City Audubon. Thanks to Jillian and everyone at Audubon New York and Audubon Connecticut who helped put this together. And thanks to all of you for joining. And we'll see everyone later. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.